Aloha. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure coming to you from Waikiki Beach. Beautiful day here in Hawaii. It's so cool. We look out one window and we see the rainbows over the Ko'olau uh, range. And we look the other way and we see beautiful surf rolling in towards uh, where we are where we are in our home condo, which is also our radio studio, just above St. Augustine's by the Sea Catholic Church, right above the altar. So uh, we have a really interesting guest with us today, Brady Stiller. We're going to talk story with him about his life. G.K. Chesterton, one of my favorite writers, and uh, his newest book, Your Life is a Story. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of manly spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. Zoop up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha. Welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Why do we call it the Bear Wozniak Adventure? Because uh, everybody's life is an adventure. We all we are all on a journey. Uh, but I was reading, um, uh, I think it was might have been GK, but it might also could have been C.S. Lewis because so so often I get them conflicted. And he said that uh, adventure is just a romantic way of saying things went really bad. <laughs> things went wrong, you know. And so a lot of life is turning adversity into adventure. Uh, but our life is meant to be a, to, is meant to uh, is meant to be lived well. It's meant to be uh, it's meant to be a, a real a real ride. Like I think in the Hobbit, the one of the one of the uh, people in the Hobbit when he was about to start his adventure, he said he said this question: "I wonder what kind of adventure this is going to be." And uh, and that's what that's what we all kind of are in wonder. And we have so with us Brady Stiller uh, in the house. His new book, "Your Life Is a Story," G.K. Chesterton and the Paradox of Freedom. Aloha, Brady. Welcome to the show. Aloha. Great to be with you. Okay, so we know I, we know C.S. Lewis liked to use his first initials because his I know his first name was I think Clive. So we get it. We know why he didn't want to let people know that was his name. What was G.K. What does the G.K. stand for in G.K. Chesterton? As I'm sure many Chestertonians know, it stands for Gilbert Keith. Yo, know, that's not bad. That's not too bad. But this sound more cool. Are you going to start going by your initials? I thought about it. I, <laughs> I wanted to do it for this for this debut uh, first first uh, book published, Br Stiller. But I chose yeah. to go by my normal normal name as it goes with our current culture and society. Yeah, it's so cool. Well, Brady, welcome to the show, Brady Stiller is an interesting person. He was a valedictorian, I think, of 2020, Notre Dame University. And so we have to give a shout out to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union. They're our main sponsor for this show. We got to go, Brady, to uh, Notre Dame. Uh, and we got to go to a couple football games once as a guest of Notre Dame Federal Credit Union. And I just remember, um, the you know, as great as that football game is, you know, when you see the when you see them running, making the run into the stadium, they run through all of the the cheerleaders outside, and they make that run into the stadium. Uh, the games are unbelievable. What? But the coolest thing, coolest thing, is that thirty minutes after the game ends, that that chapel is just packed for for mass. I remember having to sit on the floor both times uh, for for the Eucharistic celebration. So, tell can you tell us a little bit little bit about your life before we start talking about? Your Life is a Story, your new book. Absolutely. I think that's a very fitting place to start, but I'll even start just with a first thought. You talk about Notre Dame football. Guess who wrote a poem on Notre Dame football in 1930? But no. G.K. Chesterton titled The Arena, and oh, that is because cool. he was here in 1930 at the University of Notre Dame uh, giving a series of guest lectures, not something that everyone knows, uh, it was one of the two times that he came to the U.S. So we can maybe circle back around to that. But I, I couldn't miss the opportunity to mention that he wrote a poem on Notre Dame football, which you could find online called The Arena. I think my my life and my life story, I think, is the, the best place to start, an appropriate place to start, because that led me to write this book, which was not planned uh, whatsoever. I think it starts really when I was a student at the University of Notre Dame, I had for many years been discerning the priesthood. I was convinced that God had been calling me to enter the novitiate. Uh, particularly, I was discerning the Jesuits and, and felt uh, 
really great resonating with the, the Ignatian spirituality. It's the Feast of St. Ignatius today on the day hey, that we're man. recording. So how fitting. Uh, spoiler, I'm not a Jesuit today, but instead married. And it was just three months ago that I was married at Notre Dame. And guess where we took our honeymoon? But Waikiki Beach, I know, we Hawaii. Missed you. We missed you guys. We, you were here. I know, we... just missed you. Uh, I think it, we we maybe had this on the books as well, but it's all coming f- full circle. And if I go back to the original story for for how I wrote this book as well, it is a full circle story as well. I was a student at the University of Notre Dame uh, many years into my discernment of the priesthood. And about halfway through, I had the opportunity to, to choose the courses I would take the next semester. One of those courses was titled Chesterton and Catholicism. At the time, I really had no idea who Chesterton was, as many Catholics do not know who Chesterton was. I felt like I was taking a little bit of a leap of faith in enrolling in the course. Uh, I maybe asked my roommate, who had done a lot of reading growing up, if he knew anything about Chesterton. He said, his writings are pretty hard to understand, and he looks looks funny. I I think he writes so beautifully. But he does... I I would agree. But he does look a little bit, he's very unusual. <laughs> he's a very much a British man, you know, who has that, that look. Uh, that and that's that's of, why we all love him. Yeah. Um, I used to have a picture I, of him right here. I don't know where it went. I had a metal picture of him right there. Next to my <laughs> office. Yeah. Uh, but essentially, I, I enrolled in the course. It was taught by David Fagerberg, a longtime professor, recently retired. Uh, and this is a, a professor who felt like he knew Chesterton deeply. Again, Chesterton dying in 1936 um, in in Britain is where he lived. Uh, So it might seem like a a distant figure. Yet something I noticed immediately in the course is that the way that Professor Bregerberg had talked about him, he was talked about as a friend. That was something that I think I recognized among every lover of Chesterton, that Chesterton is is not just a, a distant figure yeah. author that we we like his works. He he's a friend to us all. Yeah. I quickly fell in love with with Chesterton. Yeah. Yeah. And it wasn't until later that I had the opportunity to write a thesis about Chesterton. And it wasn't the fact that I needed to write a thesis. It was actually an optional senior thesis, and I was not planning on writing one. However, it was very much a moment of divine inspiration. I was actually conducting scientific research in a lab at the time, and I was deep in thought. I was suddenly struck by this this sense. It was sort of, I would call it maybe the wind of inspiration. It felt like the Holy Spirit. I knew it. Mm. That I had to write a book. It was this subtle but certain conviction that I needed to write a book. I suddenly had a wave of ideas rush. Uh, I had this deep sense that that my life is a story, that there is a, it, there is an objective sense of the best that we are to live into. And I think that that stemmed very strongly from my own years of discernment and, and being very in touch with the sense of objectivity, the sense of the best life, the highest adventure mm-hmm. that God calls mm-hmm. each of us mm-hmm. to live into. And I felt that it wasn't just that each of our lives is a story, certainly mine was, certainly that of everyone else, but that we're fitting into a much grander story that spans space and time. I felt like that was another key component Yeah. when maybe yeah. today we're, we're sort of treating life as maybe you have your own story and it has nothing to do with me. Go go choose your own adventure. Um, good uh, luck. Yeah. Uh, and, and we don't have any mutual responsibility. Well said. Um, we can talk about the negatives of that. I'm, I'm sure we'll get to it. Uh, but but I think that's the original story behind it. I ended up writing uh, a 200, uh, 200 page plus thesis book. or book. Okay. Yes. Uh, even though it was in the context of writing a thesis, I I had this long term vision that it needed to be published. And you know, many years later, it's Word on Fire who. Uh, is publishing the book, marketing it around the world, and have already begun to see um, just the impact that it has made in this vision that I've got gotten to share with with those who have read it. We're talking with with Brady Stiller, his new book, 
your life is a story based on the the writings of G.K. Chesterton. Uh, <clears throat> you know, G.K. Chesterton to me, when I returned to the Catholic faith, I don't know, maybe it was 15 years ago, I began my journey back. Early church fathers, of course. But I would sit on the beach here in Waikiki with my iPad. because So I would sit down there and have a cigar. And uh, and as the, I would see the stars rise, you know, it's, people don't know that the stars move in the in the in the sky. The Southern Cross would rise up over on the to my left, and you see it kind of sneak above, and then gradually sink. And then days, the nights would just go by. Sometimes it was more than one cigar, but I would read the early church fathers, and then I found G.K. Chesterton, and I think it was his words, wasn't it? The pint, the the pint, the pipe. And the gospel, I think, is what he said, would go well together. And so I thought, okay, I will actually say that I know I'm not trying to promote cigars, but I would say that it's this it's because of cigars that my faith went so deep. Because I would sit on the beach there and I would be absorbed with, as you would say, uh the friendships of people would call me, what text me, what are you doing? Oh, I'm with my friends, I'm with Augustine, I'm with GK, I'm with Aquinas, you know, and there's a friendship with GK because you just he tickles you. He's has this great sense of humor. And Brady Stiller's written the book, uh, Your Life is a Journey. We're going to dig into it deeper when we get back with the Bear Wozniak adventure. Schoolofmanliness.com is a place for men of grit and grace to join together, to inspire, to encourage, and to challenge each other to grow in manly virtue. Members receive morning man meditations, a monthly curriculum that is rich with audio, video, and written content, and a trail guide to help you map out your new trajectory. Many of our members lead their sons through this same curriculum. Your membership gives you access to both the Man Cave, which is our non-Facebook type community, and the School of Manliness at schoolofmanliness.com. Become a member at schoolofmanliness.com. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to notredamefcu.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. My newest book, 12 Rules for Manliness, Where Have All the Cowboys Gone, has hit the top five in Christian books for a good reason. It's because men are searching for traction and a trail guide to live out the unique calling and the gifts that they were born with, that each man individually is factory loaded with by God. Paul said, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, do all things in love. Finally, here is a book that talks with men the way men talk with each other. Just plain old straight shoot. By the way, Mama Bears, this is your chance to get this message to your men. Go to schoolofmanliness.com or anywhere books are sold. 12 Rules for Manliness. Where have all the cowboys gone? This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We want to invite you to go to our website, schoolofmanliness.com. Uh, you know, in my new book, 12 Rules for Manliness, Where Have All the Cowboys Gone? When it first came out, well, it's still, it gets a lot of controversy because people don't like to see that word man. Uh, I was invited to speak in Tampa Bay to their conference. Uh, it was going to be called Catholic Masculinity, and we want you to be our one of our main speakers. And I said, well, I'm not going to come. What? You, you talk about masculinity. And I go, no, I don't. I talk about manliness. Masculinity has been co-opted, you know. Uh, you know, 
tw- the twisting of words is a lot of what Satan's into. But the word man, the root, root, root word of that in, in Latin is virtue, where you get the word virtue. And that's what we mean by manliness. So we invite the men to go to manliness.com. Uh, not just not just subscribe to our weekly email, which comes out and gives you our our, late, our latest radio show and things like that, but to become part of the man cave. There's a you know you can join the man cave. It's a it's a non Facebook type community where the men really get real with each other, and then we have a Zoom meetup once a month, and then we have a whole curriculum, the School of Manliness, that's got audio, video, and self assessments that you can go through as men, but also you can get your your sons a subscription, not to the man cave, but just to the school. And you can actually guide them along with you to, 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 and have real deeper conversations with them about what it means to be a man. Speaking of real men, we have GK Chesterton's in the house. Actually, we have Brady Stiller, who's valedictorian of Notre Dame. You know how that happened. I bet his, bet his uh, friends are wondering too, but he may, but his new book, Your Life is a Story, uh, GK Chesterton, Chesterton and the free paradox of freedom. So Brady, I want to ask you about this. This paradox of freedom, I I, I ponder on it a lot. I I think just a few weeks ago I was talking to my wife about that. First time it struck me was sitting on the beach. And I saw these clouds come up and uh uh and they formed these unique patterns and then they would go away and I would see surf waves break in unusual patterns. And it does become cosmological and it does become ontological when you think about uh, was that cloud predestined by God to just look just like that just at this moment? Because there seems to be a randomness in there. To what degree to, do I as a human being have this call from the Lord and this plan and this purpose that he has for my life and yet the free agency within all of that? And so we brought you here just so you could, uh, in 20 words or less, explain it. Not that, not so simple. It required a 200-page <laughs> book to to get to the bottom of it. Well, let's roll. Perfect. I think what was at the heart of this and and everything you just mentioned, this question of freedom, this question of meaning, I think for me in the philosophical approach that I took, and I felt like it kind of necessarily became philosophical, is the question of objectivity and subjectivity. And while not every person might think about the, the meaning of life or even our own freedom in those terms, object, objective, subjective. I make a claim very early on in the book that whether or not we realize it, we all have a view of the objectivity and subjectivity of meaning. Some of us might find ourselves maybe with uh, certain concepts of life being a little bit more determined. Uh, you might see that, you know, culturally, religiously, et cetera. Other people might sort of see things as happening by chance. There can be scientific forms of this, as Chesterton saw, and there can be religious or philosophical forms of it as well. Um, you know, thinking that, you know, one form of it could be that uh, we will be saved or uh, the opposite, uh, religiously speaking, regardless of our actions on earth. That's a, that's maybe one way of looking at it religiously. Of course, in Chesterton's time, scientifically, a, a big one was uh, Darwinism and, and evolution. And what's interesting is I studied both biology and theology at University of Notre wow. Dame. I, I would consider myself a man of the, the sciences, and I love the sciences. I think also the ministry through which my book is published, Word on Fire, which I'm sure many people listening follow Bishop Barron as well. I think Bishop Barron really captures that well. They they are not in competition. Uh, I found personally that they shed light on each other. I, I love studying evolution and science um, in conversation with theology. And the more that I understood our faith, the less that I saw them in competition. So that's all to say, it really comes down to this question of objectivity and subjectivity. How determined is meaning? Do we create meaning or find it? You say, the you say the word determined, it would be predetermined in a sense. It might be better for ours to for, for our people to comprehend, for knuckle draggers like me to understand. You right. Mean a predetermination, Pre- predetermined, right? exactly. So that's at the heart of it. Uh, do we create meaning or find it? I, I the sort of the, the philosophical framework that I present, and this comes through a little bit more, it kind of builds up throughout the book to, to get to this framework is that. As Chesterton so wisely saw it, there's sort of main four main philosophical worldviews that fall along the spectrum from 
from objectivity on one side to subjectivity on the other side. Determinism would be the claim that everything is predetermined, whether it's uh, physically or spiritually, uh, et cetera. And that meaning is predetermined. We have really no role in, in creating it. Uh, it's it's to be found. On the opposite side is what uh, I would call existentialism, where, and I think really is where our culture and society are today for the most part, is that we can sort of create meaning for ourselves. No one can tell me what the meaning of my life is. A third uh, philosophical worldview that Chesterton argued against consistently is skepticism, which is maybe sort of wavering in the middle. We can't really know for certain whether there is meaning to be found. Of course, that can lead to paralysis and never really pursuing a meaningful life. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth, I say, is ultimately what is the, the outcome of any imperfect worldview on the position of freedom and meaning is nihilism. It doesn't have a place on the spectrum insofar as it claims there is no meaning to life. Mm -hmm. I think Chesterton saw that ultimately as kind of the, the worst curse of existence, because bringing it back to your comment about the cigar, he, he saw everything from a cigar to a child to a mountain range as good, even if you reduce everything in this world to its uh, primitive you know, components. It is good. It is beautiful. It is not to be cursed. Um, there is a purpose to all of this ultimately. And he, he felt that was very vile to ultimately say and, and to, to sort of resign that there is no meaning in this universe. And so to kind of cap it off, and this is kind of the, the purpose of building up to this, this argument and answer is what is the right position on this? Is the meaning of our lives predetermined is it fully undetermined? Is it a little bit of both? And jumping to the answer is, and I found certainly the answer in Chesterton's work so clearly, and, and this was the key insight and purpose of the book. What if it is not a little bit subjective and a little bit objective? That would seem to make sense. What if more true to reality in the question that's maybe the most right on this ancient ontological question what if it is a paradox, which Chesterton, as as we know, who read him often, is the, the prince of paradox. He defines paradox as both extremes at their full strength at the same time. A way to maybe apply that to this ontological question is, what if life is very objective and very subjective at the same time, 100% predetermined, 100% uh, undetermined at the same time? Of course, that's the purpose of the book to get down to the bottom of that, exactly what that means, how they can both exist at the same time. But I think it's very Chestertonian. And not only that, it's very Christian. It's a very Christian claim. And I think is the Christian philosophy because ultimately paradox is inherent to the dogmas of Christianity. Uh, Jesus was not a demigod, 50% God, 50% man. He was 100% God, 100% man even if we cannot wrap our minds around it. Wonderful. Very well stated. Very well stated. We're talking with Brady Stiller, his new book, first of many, I would I would, I would, would expect, Your Life is a Story, uh, published by Word on Fire Press. Um, the Your Life is a, is a Story, based on uh, the writing of G.K. Chesterton and the, and the Paradox of Freedom. You know, I've heard it said, <clears throat> one way is to describe you know this God's perspective on on a, on a human on a person's life is like I remember when I was a little kid. I think it was in first grade. We got to draw this big old mural like on the whole all the chalkboards on one side of the wall, starting from I don't know when. Maybe it was the 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 Pilgrims all the way up to today, and you would see them. And I got to draw the cowboys. You know when the cowboys were going out west, and and um, it's been, I, I've heard it said this way that that God God views you. He knows everything about you from the beginning to the end but it's not but it's it's as if he sees that mural all at the same time we 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 can't even define time augustine tried so hard he couldn't even define what time is but we see our lives flowing along this linear path but god can see these things all at once but uh, there there are and so you know uh god knows god knows uh but like i have a friend uh, crazy todd who towed my son into 80 foot, 85 foot waves. He's a big wave rider. My son rode an 85 foot wave. He's so big, you got to get pulled in by a jet ski. And I asked him, so Todd, um, it's kind of a, bit, a little bit gnarly, you know, you riding these big waves. Um, 
don't you worry ever? He goes, no, I know that, uh, that there's a date that I'm going to die and, and, and nothing's going to stop me until that date. You know, he's like totally predetermined. Like he could jump, walk off that cliff and it wasn't going to kill him unless that was his day to die. You know, he had this kind of jaded view of everything's predetermined, even the date of my death. Well, God knows the date of your death, but it, it, that, 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 that tension between, um, between the, the uh, objective and the subjective, it's like my muscle in my arm. If I didn't have a strong muscle on either side of my, of my forearm, I would have no dexterity. When I went to drink this cup of coffee, I'd just be throwing it in my face. It's that beautiful paradox of tension that GK and you are writing about. We'll be right back with uh, more of the Bear Wozniak adventure and Brady Stiller. Very good friends with GK Chesterton. We'll be right back. We invite our mama bears to join with us at deepadventure.com. You'll have access to all of the Long Ride Home TV shows even before they air on EWTN. Plus, three years of the shareable Ocean Sunrise daily catechism videos. Plus, at deepadventure.com, a 20% discount at our online store with all of our great t-shirts and clothes and books and rosaries and medals and all kinds of accessories. You'll also get an autographed copy of Bear's latest book, and for a limited time, a Catholic biker stuffed teddy bear. All at deepadventure.com. Come on, Mama Bears, let's hear you roar. Go to schoolofmanliness.com and subscribe to our weekly email to receive video YouTube links of the Bear Wozniak radio show, as well as the Spirit of Adventure with Bear and Cindy TV show, which, by the way, is filmed in the tropics, as well as our manly evangelistic YouTube shorts. Go to schoolofmanliness.com. Be the kind of man that when he gets out of bed in the morning, the devil says, oh no, he's up. Go to deepadventure.com and invite Bear to speak. So, Tell me about, I'm going to just skip around here a little bit. Tell me about the man who is Thursday. I love that oh. story, the GK story. Jump into that for us and put it, put it in context for us. You must have seen that it was in my book that I made <laughs> yeah. reference to it. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, it's very interesting whether, whether the people listening to this right now have read my book or not yet. Uh, I would say it's mostly drawn from the nonfiction works of Chesterton. Uh, however, there are two fictional works that I think really, uh, if they're read a certain way, uh, sort of convey these ideas of the objective, the subjective, and, and really the beauty of it. One of those is the surprise. The other is the man who is Thursday. And this is a little bit of my own interpretation of the man who is Thursday. And I, I think from the people that I have shared this interpretation with, uh, they actually thought it was... Uh, really a, an interesting reading and, and quite right uh, in, in one angle of looking at it. The Man Who Is Thursday, uh, and I'm probably not going to do it fully justice. Uh, it definitely is a, a great novel of Chesterton's, and I know many have read it. Basically, at the, at the core of it is there are two sides that are opposed to each other. Uh, there's the anarchist uh, on the side of anarchy and disorder, and then there's the policeman, the side of order. So it's this tension throughout the book of those two parties against each other. Uh, am I able to spoil <laughs> the book at all? Yeah, spoiler alert. If you don't, you can turn down the radio for the next two minutes if you don't want to hear this, but go ahead. Perfect. Spoiler, spoiler alert. alert. Where it takes a turn is that the... I, I believe it's the head policeman. He becomes one of the the anarchists, um, and he becomes Thursday. There's there's seven of them, and they have to replace Thursday. Um, each of them named for a for a day of the week. Uh, very very interesting uh, Chestertonian style way of writing. Um, very fantastical, but I think very enjoyable. Long story short. You know, toward the end of the book, uh, it keeps turning further and further, where you realize actually all of the anarchists who are looking to ultimately blow up Paris uh, are actually on the side of order. And then ultimately they find out that all of them, but the one remaining person, the head, who is named Sunday, we must take down Sunday. Ultimately, we're all on the same side of order. We need to take down Sunday ultimately. 
it takes them to this uh, sort of dreamy scene in the end where they're they're trying to hunt him down. They they bring him out. Both, or, both sides or, of the both sides are trying to hunt him down. Or the the interesting when, way of uh, what happens yeah. is that all the anarchists turn out to be policemen on the same side. They're on the side of yeah. order. So then the one remaining who who's probably the one remaining anarchist they're trying to take down, who is Sunday, the head of it all. He takes them all out in the final chapter to, I believe, the Eng English countryside. And this this is kind of where I saw the application to the rest of my book. What happens is they're all brought to these seven thrones in the night sky with the stars above them. And they find that they're all for each of them. And they have costumes given to them representing the days of creation. And they see an mm -hmm. empty throne in the middle, which is, it must be for Sunday. He goes and sits down and is not really speaking to the rest of them. And they're all asking him, why did you do this? Why did you set us up like this? He was the mastermind behind it. And he he gives a quote uh, from the Bible, um, from Jesus of, can you drink the cup from which I drink? Yeah. It's very yeah. mystical. Um, but the interpretation I saw is, could this not be a way of reading our life stories? Do we not sometimes, uh, certainly many, many people see God as against us. This is a God who is not good. Uh, maybe he's neutral. Uh, maybe we have a kind of deistic view. He's maybe removed um, or sort of like tricks us. Why is there evil in the world? But once we realize the sleight of hand, that God does because he's working all things for good. Could he have not been working all of these things for our good in the end, even though it felt maybe for a lot of the journey that we were being set up, that this was maybe all kind of a, a lie or a scam. I think that's ultimately getting at that deeper mystery, the deeper truth of maybe what we will see at the end of time. I think many of us kind of in in coming to deeper faith, see that we see that sleight of hand, we realize still in this life that God is all good, and he's working all things for good. But I think that will be the realization at the end of time that all of these things will be explainable in the end, we we might have questions for God, many of the the policemen were were accusing him, why did you put us through this? Why did we have to suffer? And mm -hmm. he, he, he explains with that one line, and that is essentially how the book ends. What's the line again? Repeat it again. He, he essentially quotes uh, Christ from the Bible of, can you drink the cup from which I drink? I just recently was meditating on that in the last week. It's such a powerful, powerful, powerful statement uh, because he was about to go into, you know, he would be going into his passion. So yeah, so we're talking about Brady Stiller. His newest, his new book is called um, "Your Life Is a Story," and it's subtitled "The uh, G.K. Chesterton and the Paradox of Freedom." Let's 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 go back a little bit, okay? I mean, all the way back. You 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 mentioned in your book the cosmological and the on, uh, ontological. Can you uh, can we dig a little bit deeper into that, going all the way back to that beginning of of creation? Sure. Uh, which which particular angle and an application of of ontology and cosmology? You tell me. You tell me. Sure. Sure. So, is that not the grand story? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we come to this realization that each of our lives is a story. I, I think many people would would <clears throat> see that. However, we're also at the same time, meant to live into this, this grand story of creation that spans space and time. Somehow I'm connected to the rest of humanity that that has lived and will come going forward. Mm -hmm. If we if we don't have that view, then we're disconnecting ourselves from history, we're disconnecting ourselves from the rest of humanity. And there, there are certainly downsides to that. Um, and we see many of the uh, fallouts of that. However, if if we're going to look at questions of ontology, what, what would be the ideal? Um, we're asking this from a philosophical angle. What would be the ideal view of life? Um, it's not just 
maybe one worldview among many. What I claim in the book, which is what Chesterton keenly saw, and is not just his own worldview, but that of, I think, the Christian tradition, our lives are a story. Creation is a story. This entire existence is a story. That's a really deep ontological and cosmological claim about our being, our existence, the meaning of our lives, what we are meant to fit into. And it could be so powerful and definitive a claim that to the extent that we do not find our role in the story, we're missing out on something. Mm. We're, we're, we're feeling a deep absence to the extent that we're not finding our role in the story. And so then, then there is this uh, sort of imperative to, uh, in this life, find our role in it. That's an open invitation to you all. And, you know, maybe the tragedy is many of us just don't want to live into that story. We we prefer something much more narrow. But for Chesterton, I think he saw really this open invitation and really is ultimately, I think, the Christian message. You know, there's a there is this thing happening now where people are definitely trying to disconnect us from history. Uh, statues are being torn down and, and history is being rewritten. The meaning, you know, there's so much confusion. I think it's, it's a satanic thing to disconnect us from that because history, if you really, really get down to it, is his story. It's the story uh, that Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. He's working in as we work out, you know, our own salvation. Uh, when we get back, I want to, I want you to talk about salvation history his his story as we see that uh as we see that we're talking with uh brady stiller his newest book is um your life is a story gk chesterton and the paradox of freedom i used to have gk's picture right there and i don't know what happened to it, it must have slid down behind that that uh that uh shelf we'll be right back with more of the bear wasnick adventure People love our EWTN TV show, Long Ride Home with Bear Wozniak. Thanks to you, the show has won four different tally awards. And now, instead of waiting each week for the next episode to air, you can actually binge watch our show and even share it with your friends when you go to deepadventure.com and join the Mama Bears or the Man Cave. Along with all the other benefits, you get total access to all the seasons of our aired episodes, plus instant access to episodes that won't even air for several months. Long Ride Home with Bear Wastick, a great way to communicate the gospel in a gritty enough way that even tough men will stop and watch at deepadventure.com. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wastick adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link, or go to notredamefcu.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. Announcing Spirit Adventure TV with Bear and Cindy. So many people, especially you mama bears, tell us we want more of Bear and Cindy together. Well, we're happy to announce our website, spiritofadventuretv.com, as well as our YouTube channel, Bear Wozniak Spirit of Adventure, where you can watch Spirit of Adventure TV with Bear and Cindy. Join us where we live in the Hawaiian Islands or where we sail our boat, the Spirit of Adventure, in the Caribbean. Experience both adventure and serenity with us as we share our life together, as well as the joy and the wisdom of our faith. Go to spiritofadventuretv.com to find out more and subscribe on YouTube to Bear Wozniak Spirit of Adventure. And join us, Spirit of Adventure with Bear and Cindy. Buy 12 Rules for Manliness, Where Have All the Cowboys Gone? at schoolofmanliness.com or wherever books are sold. Mama Bears, get these books into the hands of your men. Are you still listening? I thought we warned you to change to an easy listening station. Well, you asked for it. Here is more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure.
Aloha. Welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We want to invite you to uh, check out my newest book, 12 Rules for Manliness, Where Have All the Cowboys Gone? It's been bumping along in the top 100, and sometimes it's getting up to the top 10 in Christian books for men. <laughs> and we appreciate that, uh, especially we want to ask the women who are listening to send these books to to your, the men in your life. And men, we challenge you to get to get this book. It's written the way men talk with other men. It's as if we were sitting on the back deck having a cigar and a, and a, and a, and a bourbon and talking story. It covers all these different areas of a men's life, and some of them are are gritty. Uh, and so this book really is written for men of, of grit and grace, and we invite you to uh, buy the book. Um, the thing about it is a lot of men don't like to buy books or read books. This book is going to read you. You're going to like, be, it's going to feel like you're sitting down and talking with a good friend. A lot of the men that buy it, I know many men that bought it, and once they opened it, and well, I'll give it a shot. I'll read the first chapter. They read it all the way through without stopping. And and several of them said, as soon as I was done, I started over. So uh, we invite you to go check out 12 Rules for Manliness, where have all the cowboys gone? You can get it anywhere. EW10 catalog, any Catholic or Christian bookstore, Barnes and Noble, local stores on the street there, and Amazon. And, and if you want an autographed copy, uh, go to schoolofmanliness.com, our website, and we'll get it for you. Um, we're talking with Brady Stiller, his new book, your life is a story, which is such a paradox. I thought this is something I, you can dwell on forever and never quite figure out. Uh, but now we're talking about this sense that it is there is a story that's been working out since the moment of that Big Bang. And as a surfer, uh, Brady, my my conversion experience, excuse me, I have a little bit of water. <clears throat> my conversion experience, that first sort of epiphany moment, I was probably in about seventh grade and I was sitting down at the beach I was getting cold. This was in Santa Cruz area. And I built my sand castles like I did. I fortified them to make them last as long as I could against the wave action. But I knew the next morning when I came down the, this, the, that that castle would be gone. And <clears throat> I began to have this sense of, of um, I would guess it's a bit eternity, because as the waves would just keep rolling in, I knew they were rolling in long before I had, I had uh, been born. And when I was done and my sand castles were all gone, that they would keep on rolling in. So I had that sense of eternity. And especially as a surfer, when I ride a wave, I realize the energy in that wave goes back to that first moment in time before there was time, <clears throat> that big, uh, when, when light, let there be light and the light waves uh, went out, that, that that's coming back all the way to that time. <clears throat> and then I remember seeing a sailboat uh, sailing the 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 mass just right over the it, it was disappearing over the horizon and I had that sense of kind of an infinity that it could I knew that sailboat could go wherever it wanted to go and so it had this moment in my life Brady where I was thinking how small I was but I did not feel any way insignificant I felt the awesomeness of God and I really knew in my heart that that God who had made all of this had made me and that I was a I was I was among the highest forms of creation that I was, I knew, I wouldn't have said the word I made as his image, but I knew that I was made by him and for him. And that I, and that, that a human being was, is the most special being in the, in the universe. Why do I know that now? Because Jesus became one of us. We're of incomparable worth. Um, but so I had that, that great sense of from, from the moment. And later I learned the words like ontology. And I feel like, I feel like my life was an arrow that was shot from the heart of the Lord from that quiver billions of years ago. And now here I am. So I know there's a purpose, but within that there's a freedom. But tell us your perspective on salvation history. And I say that with the context of saying his story. Absolutely. It is his story, um, but not just his. He he wants us to all be part of it. Uh, I'll maybe even start before salvation history, which you could say started with the fall, um, but that's kind of the next step. I think this is a little bit my own personal view, knowing evolutionary theory uh, and finding a, a real interest in it and not not really finding any contradiction between evolutionary theory and creation, a Christian view of it. I, As I studied evolution, seeing how there's this progression over time, uh, there was a point when, you know, if we're following Big Bang Theory, where these planets existed, then there was no life. Eventually, there were small molecules that came together. You have, uh, you know, monocellular, um, unicellular organisms, and then you have multicellular. Basically, it progresses, 
you know, to plants, then animals, and then ultimately humans. So there is that progression, I think, from a scientific perspective. But I think that's very consistent with the Christian view. And you could even read Genesis that way. Even the biblical scholars say that it all builds up toward the seventh day. I think if we start the the story of salvation history, looking specifically at the fall, there is this trajectory. And, I, and this is maybe giving more of Chesterton's view. Of course, uh, where it all started ontologically is we're in the state of perfection. We're living according to our purpose. Of course, the great tragedy, uh, as Chesterton thinks is very important to call out, is that we fell from grace. We all have the sense that the normal self is not uh, our, our normal selves that we mm. are today. There's a sense of more normalness that we're that somehow we're not able to achieve. Mm-hmm. And that gives us directionality toward where should we be heading? We should, we're, we're, we're all trying to restore that. What's very interesting, and I think Chesterton captures this most, uh, this trajectory of salvation history best in The Everlasting Man, is he focuses a lot on paganism, which is interesting. The Bible focuses first the Old Testament, of course, on the, the Israelites, the Jewish people, they're searching for God. However, he focuses a lot on paganism, which actually I think is really insightful He says that from that point on of the fall, humanity has been marked by the search. There's an existential Mm. search that Mm -hmm. there's truth to be found that we lost. There is meaning to this world that we cannot fully, uh, you know, come to find And that this world is beautiful, but it all comes to an end in death. He focuses a lot on the pagan culture, I think specifically Greek uh, philosophy, Greek mythology, as exhibiting the search for truth and meaning. And he said, they're sort of parallel rivers that would never come together. It was this deep existential longing <clears throat> that there be a story behind this, that there be a meaningful story behind this. At the same time, they needed to be true. Of course, mythology in the Greek gods was exhibiting this, this longing for a story to this all. However, it was not true. It is Mm -hmm. only in Christ, the Mm -hmm. God becoming man, that the two rivers meet Mm -hmm. together. Uh, It's truth coming together with a meaningful story. And so if we look at the coming of Christ, which Chesterton calls the strangest story in the world, and he looks at it as if he'd never heard the story before, because he thinks it is, in fact, the strangest story, but that we've just become too accustomed to it. Mm -hmm. He said, why did... The, the unlimited God limit himself. Why did the all-powerful God have to sneak into this world as if to not be located by Herod, an earthly king? Why did he bound himself in a manger? Why did he pursue death uh, with an almost uh, romantic fervor uh, as if he were in love with death? It's all a very strange story, and it doesn't make sense until that point where it all makes too much sense that Mm -hmm. this is this is the story this is where it all turns around and i think as chesterton so beautifully notes as well uh the resurrection you know happens in a garden as if to remind us of the Mm. garden where we lost our grace where we fell that is that is where we rose so gk yeah and one other thing i'll note is and i think it gets to that point of that we're talking about earlier of how do we make sense of mistakes in this life history, we're trying to erase history as you as you noted today. Uh, I, don't, I think everyone would would recognize history is messy. Uh, there have been many. There, it's been colored with evil throughout the centuries. There's no avoiding that. Um, however, how did Christ go about uh, wor- erasing evil or working with it? He did not erase it so much as make good out of it. And I think one symbol that comes out of Chesterton's work is. The risen Christ still bears the wounds, just how he did not erase the wounds. And it's actually through the wounds that will be forever marking his resurrected body. They were a reminder of the tragedy um, so as to not forget it. In the same way, even our individual stories, he does not scrap uh, and, and get rid of it. Does God not have a purpose, even if we've brought our stories way off course, even if we've marred ourselves, uh, even if we've committed heinous acts in the past, 
And even the farthest person from God, even the atheist, cannot be found because as Chesterton, I think so, so wittingly says, it seemed that on the cross, in embracing the divine abandonment, even God for him, even God himself for an instant seemed like an atheist because he felt abandoned by God. So he has outdone even the farthest atheist by embracing the divine abandonment. So no one is so far, no act is so uh, heinous that it cannot be redeemed and actually be worked for good in each of our stories. And yeah, that's, that's, yeah, it, it's true that God, God, uh, it, it says that um, he can make, make, can make all things work for the good. Um, I just want to make this clear because it's kind of heavy conversation. There is, I mean, Satan will not be able to be redeemed. There are, there are those people that um, choose hell, as C.S. Lewis would say. Um, uh, but uh, but the, but God is able through all that to turn to turn to work all things together for the good. And another another point I wanted to make is there's no natural atheists, there's, and I think that's a lot a lot of what G.K. was saying. Anywhere you go to a tribe that maybe never even knew a cell phone existed, you find them. There's some sort of worship going on. It's built it's built within our our very nature <clears throat> to be seeking God. And uh, the good news is is that when Adam fell and he hid, it was God who came and pursued him. And he just asked the question, Adam, where are you? So God's on the hunt in our lives. Uh, you have a personal story. Each of us has a personal story. Uh, but will we'll, we'll respond to the author and finisher of our faith? Because once you do that, you're really propelled into the greatest adventure of, you could possibly have. When you're fulfilling your personal talos, your purpose uh, for the way God made you uniquely and what he has planned for you. The Bible says, I know what I have in store for you, plans for peace not destruction, a future reserve for you full of hope. If you seek me, I will let you find me, if you seek me with all your heart. So so there is that part of us where we have that freedom of will, but we want to go to the Lord, and as you were saying, just the abandonment, uh, abandon ourselves to his will. It, it's in the abandonment, my own, my own personal creed, the most radical quest a man can pursue is to abandon himself to the wild adventure of God's will. We've been talking with Brady Stiller, his new book. we got to run. We already overdid our time. Your life is a story, G.K. Chesterton and the Paradox of Freedom. Until next week, Brady, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much. It's been a pleasure. Until next week, may the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you. Aloha. Thanks for listening to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Find more manly conversation at the Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure YouTube channel. Subscribe and ring the bell.